It's exciting to welcome you to our final installment of the second season of the January series in July. My name is Michael Wiltskett, the director of the series. As we left our series in January, I challenged us to continue being curious, and we've had the opportunity to be curious two times already. The gift of curiosity is that it can always be there, and summer sometimes allows us to be even more curious. The January series is grateful to our underwriters and supporters for enabling us to share these three opportunities to be curious this summer. Today, we have a treat with two Calvin faculty, Kate Van Leer, Professor of History, and Matt Hewn, Professor of Engineering. Kate and Matt are both recent winners of the Presidential Exemplary Award for Teaching here at Calvin University, the highest honor the university awards for teaching. The award criteria notes that Award recipients not only have exceptional teaching skills, they also consistently influence the lives and careers of Calvin University students in lifelong Christian ways. While their academic areas are different, they have many things in common. Hard work and preparation, expectations of themselves and their students, and care for the whole person. Today's conversation is led by Emerita Professor of English and good friend of the series, Karen Sape. Again, thank you to our underwriters whose support allows us to step into this space. We hope you enjoy week three of the January series in July, and we can't wait to share our January 2024 lineup with you in the coming months. Well, Kate and Matt, you teach in very different fields. Uh, Kate, would you tell us a little bit specifically about what you teach in history? Sure. Uh, I teach, these days I teach both the gateway and the capstone courses. So the only two required courses in the discipline, the first one being the rather nuts and bolts, how to do historical research and writing course. And the second one, which ideally students take in their senior year, being a more philosophical, reflective course, standing back and thinking about the evolution of historical thinking over the centuries and through the present. And, um, in between those, I teach upper level courses in my field, which is early modern Europe. Uh, the most common course I teach these days is the Reformation. Um, I've done a lot of other things in Renaissance Italy or history of Spain, or um, I'm going to be teaching history of England starting next year. Uh, I also teach outside the department in the, in the honors program sometimes, and I've taught in um, Dutch and Spanish language departments. Um, but yeah, most of what I do these days is is actually teaching outside my research field in in the history department. Um, so kind of looking at the discipline of history and the techniques of history in a pretty in a pretty broad sense. And do you have a favorite course to teach? That's hard. I would say in recent years, my favorite course was probably Honors 101, which was an interdisciplinary course taught with a colleague of yours from English, Lou Klatt. So it was English and history, um, first year honor students using those two disciplines to uh, explore, well, world history and literature from Plato's Republic and the ancient Greek world to the modern day Middle East. Um, and it was a very intensive five credit course for the students, a very highly motivated group of students, and they were a pleasure to teach. So that's been my recent favorite. I, another favorite is teaching off campus. I've had the privilege to teach the semester in Britain twice, and there's something really special about teaching on site in a place where you can take students to the places you're teaching about and kind of build the curriculum around the location. So. That's a that's a favorite too, but that's that's a rare thing. And over on the other side of campus, Matt, what do you teach? I'm in the engineering department. If you take engineering at the top, you can break that down into the different disciplines. So my discipline is mechanical engineering. Mechanical engineering has two halves to it. We sometimes jokingly call them the solid side and the fluid side. And the I teach in the fluid side, and in that side there's further specialization down into the energy space, thermodynamics, heat transfer, fluid mechanics, and I, I teach in there. Increasingly, I'm teaching a lot more on sustainability and environmental uh, topics as they relate to engineering and economics. So I'm in that, and sometimes I'm in that space as well. Good. And do you have a favorite class? Will we understand what you say? 
if you tell us. Well, I'm going to decode that as, do I have a favorite child, which, <laughs> no, I don't. I love both my children equally. I love all my classes equally. They're fantastic uh, opportunities to engage with students. I think if I had to choose one right now, it would be uh, the end course of a sequence in the thermal fluid sciences. Um, and it's, uh, it's a course where we do an analysis of a particular kind of machine, but there's room to bring in a lot of financial, economic considerations, um, environmental considerations as well. So, um, and then I do a, a fun project in that class with the students every year as well. So I think that's my favorite course right now. It's called Thermal Systems Analysis. And both of you, just to clarify, teach primarily undergraduates, maybe exclusively undergraduates. So um, why do you like teaching college students? I think the 18 to 22 to 23 year old time frame for students is incredibly fascinating. Jokingly, we could say you take somebody off the high school parking lot and you turn them into a real adult, and that happens in a very short amount of time. I think it's quite a privilege to be a part of that process, to watch these students go from truly not being adults to then being adults and be able to um, make positive contributions to society. And I love to walk alongside students as they go through that process. A lot of that process is just becoming a better human being, but then there's a lot of it that's okay, at least in my field, gaining skills, specific skills that will allow them to also be a professional. And I love to see both of those pieces come together as students walk through their four years. Um, one of my most treasured times as a professor is at graduation when you meet the families of these students. Um, many times it's the only time I'll meet their family. Sometimes it's the second time because I may have seen them when they first arrived on campus. And then to meet them again at the end of four years is just a very special time um, because the parents uh, and family are so proud of their students and rightfully so. And then, But to think that I had some part in that process of moving them, uh, getting them ready for the rest of their lives is, is a real honor. And Kate? Yeah, I, that was really eloquent. And I agree with, with Matt's uh, description of all of that. <laughs> I, it's a privilege to walk alongside these students and learn with them and really learn from them. I, I often find myself thinking that I must have learned more from my students by the time they graduate than they have learned from me. And more and more of my students aren't history majors. So um, I think unlike you, I often see a student once or maybe twice and that's it. And they go off and major in English or engineering and, and graduate and do something completely different. But uh, I'm so inspired by the things that they do, both our majors and our non-majors, and to see them discern what their gifts are and what God's calling them to do over the course of their time here, and then often keep in touch with them after graduation as they go off and, and work in teaching or journalism or founding schools in Cambodia, like one student, you know, I still see when she comes back <laughs> from the mission field, but um, to, to see what the, they're taking their, their gifts out and doing with them um, is really, um, really inspiring. So. I wonder if either of you sometimes um, have a student who you're teaching your subject and helping them realize that that subject is not where their calling is um, to, help them, to help them reorient their, their goals. Is that a satisfying thing or is it a disappointment? It's hard. <laughs> I mean, wh whether it's satisfying or disappointing, it's really hard to do. Um, and I, it's it's not often satisfying in the moment because students are. It's it's never good to be told you're not good at this, you know. Um, but but and you don't say it that bluntly either. <laughs> but but the student well, understands. They they they, they, they discern yeah. it that way. But to help them discern that and not to give them the kind of positive reinforcement. No, you really can do this, keep trying, right? Um, but I, just this weekend, I was talking to a friend at church who somehow knows a student that I had about 10 years ago. And this was a student who was really struggling 
and was in the education program, and I just didn't see this person as a successful teacher. Um, and I, I wanted to help her succeed. I can't say I specifically pointed her on the path to doing something else, but I tried to encourage her, although not to encourage her to keep continuing and going into teaching. And this woman just told me how well she was doing and how much she appreciated having me. And, uh, you know, she didn't overhear the conversations that I'd had with a student, but it just made me realize that sometimes it takes many years for that discernment to, to work itself out. But ultimately, um, it's, a, it's, it's rewarding to have done that, although it's, it's not usually fun to do it. Sure. I, I think so many students come in, and their parents too, thinking that you should start with a major and stick with it, and that's the most efficient way through college. And it may be the most efficient, but it's not always the best. In the engineering program, we have a dynamic that's, that leads to a lot of this discernment and finding out maybe that's not where you want to go. And the dynam dynamic is this, it's a very packed major. It's a doable major in four years, but it's very packed. So the advice is usually, let's start in engineering. And if it doesn't work out for you, then you can, you know, go, go to another, another major, another program. And we see that happen quite a bit. Mm -hmm. It is as rewarding to participate in those conversations as it is to participate in conversations where we're leading an engineering student through the entire program. So when those students, when they have those conversations with students who need to go somewhere else or who want to go somewhere else, then you can ask really important questions. Well, have you thought about what really gets you excited? Right. Have you thought about what doesn't feel like work or studying? Because if you can find those things, then you can find a route to a fulfilling life, career, vocation, calling, whatever you want to call it, um, that will not feel like a burden every day when they go to work. And that's, that's the best we can hope for a lot of our students is, is that what they do is something that comes from inside who they are, who they think they are, and they express that outward in their vocation. Um, and it's a joy to f help students find that whether or not it happens to be in my department. Sure. Yeah, college is partly a process of discovery. I don't, statistics, years ago I saw that something like 40% of students who enter with a major decided end up changing it. And uh, I, I encourage students to explore a bit. Um, what made you want to be a teacher, Kate? I always found satisfaction in helping people figure things out, even when I was a kid in middle school, helping friends with math homework, you know, so I, I sort of, and my mother was a teacher, so that was just sort of a vocation that I grew up seeing close at hand, and it felt natural, and I think I knew I wanted to be a teacher before I knew I wanted to be a history teacher, be a historian, get a PhD, so I thought for a long time maybe I'd become a high school teacher. Um, I, I ended up getting a PhD in history, not really through a profound process of discernment, but more just by following the path of least resistance and staying in school as long as I could keep getting funded. And, um, and then I, I didn't major in history in college. I was a very interdisciplinary major. And when I had to pick a discipline for a uh, graduate study, history still seemed like the, the most interdisciplinary path I could take. So I, you know, I chose my discipline last and I chose being a, being a teacher first. Um, and, um, yeah, so it's just that, the, that satisfaction in helping people understand things that I, that I enjoyed and, and wanted to keep doing in some way or other. Yeah. And, and Matt, yeah, I mean, you worked for NASA. Why yeah. did you leave the space program for Calvin students? It is, uh, my story is similar to Kate's in that I found that I was helping everywhere I went. Um, you know, in middle school, like you said, um, high school, college, you know, graduate school, even my first job as, a, as an engineer, I was helping people. What I realized sort of partway through my life was that helping was actually teaching or it was very related to it. So I thought, yeah, maybe, maybe someday I would like teach 
But I looked around me and the best professors that I had were ones who first had a lot of experience in the real world being real engineers. And they brought that experience into the classroom. So I put that in the back of my mind. I thought, okay, well, the first thing I need to do is get a job, get a proper engineering job. And it happened to be, uh, as you say, with NASA. Um, but I always had that in the back of my mind. And uh, the engineering department sent a, a poster once and it had this picture of John Calvin going, John Calvin wants you <laughs> like, like uh, Uncle Sam, uh, identifying an opening in exactly my field. So um, I applied after nearly a decade of, of working as a real engineer uh, to come teach. And uh, it's been a rewarding and wonderful time ever since. Let me make you both a little uncomfortable because Calvin is not known for uh, promoting pride of any kind in oneself, but you're both recipients of the Presidential Teaching Award. Matt, what are you really good at as a teacher? Whoa. You're right, I'm feeling uncomfortable right now. <laughs> um, okay, I think... I think um, this is something I try to do, and it also appears in my student evaluation, so I think I'm comfortable in saying it is something that, that I managed to pull off. Um, and that is providing challenges for students that sometimes they don't even think they would be able to meet, but also then providing the support for them to be able to achieve those challenges. And I think that's important to have both of those factors because if you have the challenge without the teaching support, the pedagogical support, um, just in our case, you know, the support on doing homework problems or whatever, right? If you, if you have the challenge without the support, then the students get really cynical. Mm -hmm. And if you have a lot of support without any challenge, then students are bored because it's not hard. What's the point of doing this? I already know how to do it. Um, so, so getting that balance right, I think, is a really challenging aspect of being a teacher. Um, but when you get it right and when you see students in their course evals say, I didn't think I could do this, but uh, with the professor's help, I made it through. Or five, ten years later, students come back and say, your courses were really hard, but they taught me how to work well and how to think well about challenging problems. Then it's all worthwhile. Uh, to, to the effort to to get that balance right is all worthwhile when you get that kind of feedback. And Kate, what do you yeah. do really well? It's well said. Um, I mean, I, I I recognize that sense from student evaluations of, um, yeah, it was hard. She made me work really hard, okay. but uh, it was it was gratifying. Um, uh, it was really hard to get an A in this class, <laughs> um, but at the same time. People say I'm accessible, um, so you give a challenging research paper assignment. You break it down into many, many stages, and you give them lots of feedback at each stage, and you help them revise, fine tune, craft. But in some cases, you know, throw away a topic that's just not working and start over again, and give them give them constructive advice about um, how to come up with a brand new topic, um, and be willing to put in a lot of time so they can see that you're working hard as, as a role model for them. Um, so that's part of it. In the classroom, I think um, ways of achieving that sort of balance between high expectations and adequate support. Um, for me, it's a matter of working pretty hard for to prepare every class. I can't just go in and teach a class I've taught 20 times before off the top of my head. I have to sit down. Ideally, I like to have an hour before every class to sort of get my head into it and think about how's this discussion going to go? Because usually I'm doing some combination of lecture and discussion and students have read something and I very often change the textbook every year or every other year. So it's a, a new a new reading often, even if I've taught the material before, well, how does the author approach it? How am I gonna pose questions to get them to think about this author's take on it and how that compares with other perspectives that I'm addressing in the lecture? So you, you come up with kind of a roadmap mm -hmm. and coming up with a roadmap for a good class discussion for me is a lot more work than just writing a good lecture because I'm in control if I'm lecturing. 
and I have a script and I can follow the script and make sure I show the right images at the right time. And if students have questions, that's fine. But if I have a, a text I've given them that I want to discuss for 10 minutes or the whole period, whatever it is, there are different ways it could go. And I think some people can just wing that. And I really admire them and envy those people, but I can't. So um, I have to kind of write out for myself the outline of where the discussion might go. And sometimes there are three different scenarios and then give myself prompts you know, for where to go. If the students take it this way to kind of nudge them back to this, because there's a conclusion I want them to get to and I want them to get there themselves. Um, if that fails, you know, sometimes I'll have to say, well, that's really interesting. What I was hoping we'd get to. <laughs> um, but preparing all that is is hard work. And sometimes it bombs. Um, but, you know, generally the, the, the student feedback is that um, we have good class discussions. So I take that as an affirmation that most of the time it's going well. Can I pick up on two things there? Please. So I noticed you, you said two things that I think are really important and I see in my teaching as well. Uh, the first one is hard work. It does take hard work to provide all that support, the, the support the students need to be successful in the classes in, in the classroom. Um, and the second thing is risk. You, in your field, you're, you're in your classroom, you're letting conversations and discussions go in directions that you don't control. And that's, I think that's hard to do. In, in, my, in my area, I set projects for students, and I don't know where they are going to go with the project. And that's risky, and that's hard. Um, but I think there's a lot of reward that comes with that risk. If, and some doesn't always come off, but if it comes off more often than not, I think then it's worthwhile. Do you, do you find that risk-reward thing as yeah, well as ab absolutely, important? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm just thinking, both of us are ref referring to student evaluations, you know. <laughs> They're yeah, not yeah, always yeah. good. <laughs> And it, it's gratifying to think back over the years to, to bad ones that you used to get and don't get so much anymore. And, and one of the ones I got early on in teaching that I guess really hurt because it stuck with me was- <laughs> Even to this day. Yes. She makes you feel stupid. Oh. And I felt so Why? terrible reading that. And, but when you were talking about you know giving them a challenge and then helping them achieve it, obviously that student didn't feel adequately helped <laughs> you know, and thought that the challenge was just unmeetable, I guess, and, and went away discouraged. So, I, you know, maybe that was constructive feedback because maybe I've been trying to work very hard so people don't go away feeling stupid, mm -hmm. but feel as though, wow, they've actually learned a lot in the, in the course of the class. Right. Um, that's right. What have you learned about how to motivate students? Not every student comes in with the drive and determination to succeed. Um, what, what works for you, Kate? Students have to be curious about the subject for the class to work, right? Some students come in with that, right? So I mentioned that honors class that was one of my recent favorites. I didn't have to motivate those students or make them curious. And I, I remember saying to Lou early on in that course, you know, if we just had a really bad day and came in and hadn't been able to prepare, this class could probably teach itself, right? Um, but in most classes, you do have to kind of create the curiosity. Um, and this, so this is about, I guess this is about motivating students, you know, to care about a particular class or like, it's not the same issue as motivating students to succeed in the long run. Have study but, habits. And right. Um, that's maybe a different question we we'll talk about later, but um, sometimes just figuring out what the hook is to get students interested in the topic because history doesn't come as a set of projects to do like engineering, right? It, that's why some people say history always bored me. It's just all this stuff, you know, you got to know and it's memorization. So you, you have to create or find curiosity. And so you can do that by trying to tie it to current events. And it's sad to say, but this crazy world we live in recently, there are so many terrible things going on that very often they're valuable hooks for, for getting people interested in a topic. You know, why does Russia feel they have the right to dominate Ukraine? Or, you know, why are the Palestinians so angry at Israel? Well, to understand this, we have to go back to the 19th century. And that 
that can just create a, a certain um, curiosity that will get them through the class. If, if it's a topic they think they know already, then you have to kind of undermine that and unsettle it a little bit. So, you know, if, last time I was discussing the Holocaust, which nobody gets through high school without learning about the Holocaust. You no, know, it's not that they don't think it's interesting or important, but they get they can get complacent or think there's not much more to learn about it. But I remember starting out that class with um, two questions. And so how many people died in the Holocaust? Um, and most people know the answer, you know, about six million. And, and, and then I said, well, what was the Jewish population of Germany, do you think, on the eve of the Second World War in 1939? And people were guessing, you know, eight or 10 million? No. Well, it's lower than that. I kept making them revise their guess down until nobody guessed the true answer, which was half a million. I told them, yeah, see, you're surprised. They were surprised, too. <laughs> and there's this discrepancy. They think, wait, half a million? You know, well, and it plants questions in their minds, right? Well, where'd all those people come from? And then you know, how how Germany get control over all those people? Or why was there such profound anti-Semitism against this group that was less than 1% of the population? That plants new questions they didn't realize they had. And then you can sort of teach the class to try to answer those questions. So yeah, I guess that's a long answer to a short question. But essentially, I think finding ways to find what students are curious about or to make them curious if they're not is, is the starting point. Yeah. Me. Yeah. Uh, Matt? I think I got two things. Uh, the first one is I learned long ago that the professor will set the upper limit on enthusiasm in the classroom. Like no student is going to be more excited about the topic that I'm teaching than I could potentially be as a general rule. So if I set the enthusiasm level here, students will be maybe this excited. But if I set the enthusiasm level here, then maybe students will come up to this level. So that that doesn't mean I'm walk around like a crazy, I don't know. <laughs> Cheerleader for thermodynamics. Exactly. I mean, well, and we know the world needs more of those, <laughs> but maybe I'm not the right person for that job. But it allowed me to say, okay, um, I don't have to be shy about showing my enthusiasm for the topic or for the particular part of the lecture today that I find most fascinating. I can just call it out and say, I think that's really interesting, and here's why, and here are the implications for it. And along the way, then, some students, who especially the topics that I teach, they don't have these topics in high school or whatever. So, so now they're introduced to a brand new topic that's actually important for engineering, and they, in my classroom anyway, have permission to be enthusiastic about it. So that's the first thing. Second thing, I think, is, um, at least in the engineering space, open-ended problems. So much of the education that the students who I see in my classroom have had up to the time they get here is math and science. They're interested in it. And up until the time they get to the university setting, they, um, they experience math and science as topics that have specific answers to questions that are posed. But we need to move them, like I was saying before, from just off the high school parking lot to be able to be professionals and or, or kingdom citizens where the problems that they will address don't have those easy answers. So to, to draw them along on that progression, then um, we start posing more and more and more and more open-ended open -ended questions and, and problems that don't have a specific answer. And just like you unsettled me earlier, those questions unsettle the students. Mm -hmm. And it's fun to walk alongside them, challenging to walk alongside them, challenging to provide enough support for them as they grapple with these open-ended questions and problems. Um, and in both cases, that really stimulates creative thinking. I say it requires it, right? I mean, that, that's the way you get through those, those situations, those, those problems, is, is think of things in new ways that literally nobody's ever thought about before because nobody's ever tackled that question before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and there are other kinds of projects that I haven't talked about yet in history classes that really stimulate creative thinking. I mean, I was talking about 
stimulating curiosity for students to, you know, engage in a discussion or listen to a lecture, but but you can give them a project like design a, a design an exhibit, right? And and that, you know, is the best way to stimulate curiosity, I yeah. think. I mean, uh, I, I taught a, one of the last interim classes that I taught here um, where we had these three weeks to fill. <laughs> I, I did this hands-on project as part of the class called, I called it Case Histories, and I got to display cases around campus. I requisitioned about eight of these and um, assigned each one to a group of three students, and they had to come up with a concept for a for a exhibit and put it up there, and it was up for the rest of the semester in most cases. Some in the library, one in your department, one over in the in the gym, um, and that's you know that's really and when they know it's going to be out there for the for the world for the yes. campus to see for the next three having months. a genuine audience that matters yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you've also had a lot of success with simulations yes yeah games historical games why do those work so well similar um, similar dynamic I guess there's a um, an agenda you know you have to the, the games that I've done most lately, the, mo the most developed ones, I mean, I, I used to just make up my own little games that would take one class period or something, but there's this whole curriculum of um, published games now called Reacting to the Past, which are great, not only because there are some great games out there, but because there's this whole community of teachers who use it and they have an annual conference and you go and play the games and sort of learn how to do it. And then, then you have this very supportive community too that has a a Facebook page. So if you're in the middle of a game and you're having a problem, you can always, you know, what happens when the Cardinal in the Galileo game makes this decision instead of that decision? You know, what do I do? So um, these games typically take three weeks or so of the curriculum and they're very immersive and they they cover all different topics. I've done one on, on um, ancient Athens and one on the French Revolution and one on the, the debate about the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C. The latter was part of the same course where we did the public, the, the display cases. Um, but they all have a common uh, structure, which is that students are divided into factions. So it's a game. It's a competitive game. And typically there are four factions, right? So, you know, in the French Revolution or the Athenian game, it's sort of from the ultra conservatives, you know, so the, the Catholic monarchists or the oligarchs to the real radicals and various types of moderates. And they all have objectives that they're supposed to achieve, you know, whether it's disestablish the church or, uh, you know, re reorganize the Athenian uh, constitution to give voting rights to the entire population. Or, um, and so students are strategizing about how to, how to win the game, how to achieve these things. And then on the individual level, you know, they know they're being graded and judged for the the quality of the speeches that they prepare and give, and then the extemporaneous arguments that they have with each other. And I mean, in a way, there. this is not a, a question of being a great teacher in, in the traditional way, because you're not doing anything except sitting in the back of the class watching them do this, <laughs> right? So um, the teacher's job in this is setting the game up. They're, they're typically two or three classes before the game starts where you get them interested in it. And that's where you have to do what Matt says, sort of set the excitement level, um, give them enough histor historical background to understand the context, assign them the roles, explain how it works, model it a little bit. And then you're in the back of the room and they're doing it. They're in the front of the room. Somebody's the president of the assembly or whatever the role is, moderating the discussion. Um, and they're meet meeting outside of class to strategize. And I mean, and the honor students really got into this to the point where sometimes the the four RAs were coming to us and saying, could, could you just talk to them about just just toning it down a little bit? And, you know, there are other th other things going on in life with this game. Um, but the, yeah, the, the game feature of it is hard. It's hard for me to appreciate it because I'm not a gamer and I realize the more I do these, a lot of these students play a lot of games, you know, whether it's Dungeons and Dragons or online games, and they understand that dynamic better than I do. So I sort of learn from them. Um, but it's um, it's a very self motivating enterprise, and it's fun to watch and to, to kind of mentor from the side. Can I jump in and say a few yes. things? Yeah. What I love about that, Kate, is is uh, a, a phrase that I use sometimes, um, and it sounds like you're you and I are similar in this. 
um, because in some of the projects that I do, I get the same dynamic happening. But I like to say less teaching, more learning. Yeah, yeah, it's good. So you, you as the teacher, do everything you can to set it up, and then off you go. And maybe you got to provide a few guardrails here and there, and you got to yeah. get on your Facebook page like, oh, what happens when? <laughs> um, but I, I see that dynamic too with some of the group projects that I set, and it just makes me. I mean, I almost laugh to myself when I'm in the back of the room and the students are just going at it. Yep. And you just think, wow, you know, this is fantastic. Yep. And it's, I feel sometimes like a little bit of a slacker as a teacher. Like what, I'm not, I'm not standing up in front and teaching today and, and dispensing my wisdom to these students. I think that takes more restraint sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. It does. Yes. And, and, but the truth is what I've done ahead of time is set up the experience and set, in my case, set the question, set the structure of the project, figured out who the customer is or whatever, and then off they go. Right. And it's it's just really exciting to see that happen. And there's still work involved because it, yeah. in these games, you know, the paper, the speeches they give are based on written papers and, and mm -hmm. I'm grading the papers. And some of them are great and some of them aren't. And, and those people need coaching about right. what you could do better next time to really use these primary sources that you're meant to use to inform the argument in the paper and really make it persuasive. And um, so, but it's behind the scenes work. Yeah. The other students don't realize you're doing that. <laughs> it's the one student gets the comments back. I want to shift gears. Um, there have been so many new technological advances and new resources made available in the last decade or so for teachers that in some ways the the possibilities and the dangers have have been radically uh, transformed. The one I want to zero in on just for a minute or so is artificial intelligence, um, and I some of us are in a panic about it. Some of us are very excited about AI as it's as it's called. Um, I, I'd like you both to talk a little bit about where you are with thinking about how artificial intelligence might enhance or endanger what you do as a teacher. Do you want to go first or? Sure. I think this, the AI revolution that we're in right now has a lot of characteristics of previous disruptive technologies. Um, every disruptive technology highlights some things and diminishes other things. Um, it's not, none of these disruptive technologies are value neutral. Mm -hmm. They, they, they enhance some aspects of life that maybe we would want to enhance, but they might enhance some aspects of life that we would not want to enhance. So I think it's important to see the AI revolution in the context of other previously disruptive technologies. And, you know, what, what can we put like the personal computer, the automobile, uh, the telephone, you know, whatever. There's any one of these you could you could see in that same in the same way of thinking about it. Um, in my particular field, I'm seeing, and in my personal use of these technologies, I'm seeing benefits at the moment. Um, and I can outline a few of those just briefly. Uh, the first one would be, um, like, in a way, you can use these AI bots to generate specific like tutorials or primers that nobody else has done before. So in my particular example, I needed to know how to program a certain database in the R programming language and details aren't important. But what I asked the, the generative AI to do was write me a primer to tell me how to program a database from the point of view of an expert R programmer. R is a computer language. And it nailed it. And it saved me a ton of time. I have colleagues who are working in the English language, but whose first language isn't English um, in many countries around the world, some research colleagues of mine. And what they are doing is feeding paragraphs to these generative AIs that they've already pre-written in English. And they'll ask it the question, can you write this from, from the point of view of a native English speaker? And they're finding a lot of success and, and help with that. So um, one of my colleagues the other day said that ChatGPT, one of these generative AIs, is a time saver, not a lifesaver. Mm. And I thought that was a pretty good summary 
for where, at least in my research community, we're at right now. In terms of teaching, um, I'm a little dubious yet. I think these tools have to get better. So in terms of the specialized topics and materials that I teach, these generative AIs don't yet know those topics. Um, but if we get to the point where they start to know them, then my questions to the students just go up a level. There, there's not so much detail about what's the entropy of water or steam at a certain pressure and temperature. It's um, how would you design a system that uses that entropy information? So, so your students are able to work at a higher level well, because that lower level work is taken done for them. It, it's it, a bit it, like when four function calculators came into my life as a kid. Yeah, no, yeah. that's right. Okay. So that's that's a that's a way that it's playing out in, in my field, and I, and I'm not saying that there aren't real problems with it because I know that there can be real problems. I just, for the moment anyway, want to highlight those positive aspects that I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Kate, I have a feeling you and I resonate about <laughs> dangers to hear. I, I wanted Matt to go first on that because <laughs> I knew he had some more positive answers oh, and, I'm, and I'm glad he did. And I, I think that provides a good broader context for my own responses because I am more on the anxious end of the spectrum of responses to AI. I have not yet taught the historical research methods class since you know AI came out last fall. I teach it every spring, but I've been thinking about how I'm going to be changing that course. And um, you know, you can't, you can't tell students not to use it. Um, so I, I think I will be crafting assignments where I will tell students to have AI go and generate a research paper on a given topic, and then critique it you know, f find out what sources it used or what sources it invented. And I, I personally, I find it helpful right now that AI is still in the stage where it makes up sources and you can catch it at that, <laughs> right? Um, I fear it's going to be beyond that soon. But, um, but, you know, even if it is finding and using only real sources, are these the best sources? And so there are, and I've, I've heard other examples of people doing this already, you know, giving the students an assignment, have AI do this and then critique it. Yeah. And that's a great model in a lot of disciplines. Sure. So I think we'll all be doing that in history and other humanities courses at Calvin. That doesn't, however, take away the danger of students abusing AI because you can tell AI to write a poem and then tell the student to critique the poem that AI wrote, but you can also tell AI to critique its own poem so you can't really <laughs> know whether the student's critique is really so it's you know the, the academic integrity problem is there on a on a new level and and i guess for me it emphasizes the importance of talking to students early on about academic integrity and making it clear that this is a a personal issue and a moral issue and an issue about you know respect between a student and the professor and trust and it's not something that we can always catch you at um, there aren't sort of technological solutions, you know, sometimes you can find plagiarism, sometimes you can't, but, but there has to be a, a, a just a fundamental understanding of, of trust. Um, and, and AI raises the stakes there. Um, but in a broader sense, I think it's just sort of the next step in a revolution that we've already been seeing over the last 20 years or so of the proliferation of electronic information and electronic sources. And, and in history, it's a huge boon to historical research because you don't need to leave your desk to do research now on any topic. You don't need to go to the archives in, in foreign countries. You don't need to go into Heckman Library. You can find it all there on your computer screen. And that's a wonderful advantage. It saves lots of time and travel and searching. But of course, it also deprives you of the, the rich experience of going to the archives in Spain or going into Heckman Library and browsing the stacks and finding that the book that's really valuable is right next to the book you, you found in the catalog. Yeah. <laughs> and you wouldn't have known it unless you're walking around in the stacks. And, and students don't do that much of that. So one of the things I try to do in my research course is just make students go into the stacks, right? And I, I used to have an exercise that required them to go and use the extensive first floor reference collection, but that's not there anymore. So now I try to at least get them to, to use the, the physical books uh, upstairs in the library. 
um, as sources because it's harder for students to understand the nature of sources and where they come from and how they're produced when they all come across looking kind of uniform on the computer screen, right? What's what's an old book that was published in the 19th century versus a you know a new monograph that was published five years ago? You find them in electronic form. You don't even see the, the kind of physical difference in the volume. What's the difference between a scholarly journal and a popular journal? You know, the scholarly journal, if you're picking it up in your hand you're, and you're just appreciating that it's not a glossy magazine with advertisements and photographs and it is a different kind of thing, if the article just comes through you, through the screen to you, you don't appreciate that. You don't appreciate the difference between an article and a book review. You know, the book reviews are always in the back of the journal. And I've often seen students cite a book review and not even realize what it is as a kind. For us, that's just kind of a basic genre. So part of part of what we do in the research methods course is introduce students to these different genres and show them sort of what they look like in physical form before they all end up on the screen. And then most importantly, talk about how to, how to evaluate. Why is this more trustworthy than that? Um, what kinds of authorial biases and um, agendas are behind these sources? Why, why do they exist? Why were they produced? What are, what are they trying to persuade people of? How can you make use of them and taking those biases into account? That's always been what historians do, but it, it's, it's harder to do in the digital age because acquiring all the sources is so much easier. So you mentioned having students learn to evaluate. I, I want to go for a, a moment to uh, what, why do, you, why do you want your engineering students to take history? Why do you want your history students to take engineering or physics or math courses? How do those help them develop their own areas? Why is a core curriculum important? You want to go first? You want me to go? Sure. Um, that, but for me, that's two very different questions. Why is the core curriculum important, and why do I want my students to take engineering courses? Because the core doesn't. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've, I mean, I love it when I, my students take engineering courses, and I have to say, engineering students are some of the best students you know, yeah. to get in your in your core courses. And I do want my students to have math and science, right? And and I I, I want them to have sort of a sense of. So let's focus on that then. Why why do you want them to have math and science? I I think. First of all, beyond what's good for them in the classroom or as students, you know, just as well-rounded people, I think we all need to be able to, to think both um, in literary terms and in numerical terms. And people need to be literate about scientific topics, right? Uh, you know, a topic like global warming certainly straddles the, the humanities and, and uh, sciences divide. But you know, really to understand scientific arguments. Um, we can't give you the, the tools for doing that in a history class. Um, so I want people to be scientifically and numerically literate um, uh, as good citizens and as just, you know, I just, you're a better person if you can just add and multiply in your head, you know, without a calculator. <laughs> just a so all those things. Um, why is the core important? Because, I mean, the core does tend more to push engineering students into humanities courses than it does to push humanities courses into engineering students, right? Humanities courses are the ones that people tend to sort of say, oh, I got to take this, I got to take that. Um, why is that important? Wow. <laughs> Those skills that we say students get in our history courses that they get in your English courses as well, you know, um, making an argument, defending an argument uh, in written form, in, in oral form, um, uh, understanding the human experience in a whole range of ways that you do when you when you read literature and read um, the stories that have, you know, the, the terrible things that have happened in the past and that help you understand that even though we're in a terrible time of history right now, things have actually been worse for people. <laughs> Um, just to kind of broaden your sense of of the human condition and to develop a sense of empathy for for other people. Um, you know, I think learning about the past and learning about people who live in diverse cultures these days and in other times helps you be more empathetic and understanding of the real people that you're going to be outside 
the walls of college. Um, so for me, those are all reasons to take the humanities and to take a broad uh, section of humanities as well as um, a bit of math and science. And Matt? I think I'll... I'm going to say yes to everything that Kate just said, all right? Because I don't want to repeat it, I, but I would also don't want anybody to think the next thing I'm going to say, which is engineering focused, is because I don't think any of that's important. Because I think absolutely 100%. Um, I completely agree with that. Um, now, from the point of view of a person whose job it is to help young people become engineers, um, there's a couple of things to to point out, and I'll just I'll just because we're here today, we'll, we'll talk, I'll talk first about history and engineering. Um, I think it's really important for engineering students to know how to think about things historical because engineering itself has a history. And you need, you, you become a better engineer when you understand the moves that engineering has made in, in all the spe specific types of engineering as well. But I'll just say engineering broadly. If you know how the moves that engineering have made over over time affect the way the discipline is practiced now and the way it exists now, then I think you become a better engineer. So you have to be able to start thinking historically um, just to understand the discipline and the environment that you're in when you're on the job. Second thing to say is that one of the interesting moves that engineers always make is they start in the real world with some sort of problem. Then they go into an abstract world of mathematics and science and formulas and numbers and manipulation to decide something. And they bring that back down into the real world. Okay. So unless you can do that move well, you are doomed to be a not so good engineer. And part of the four-year process of educating engineers is training them, and I use that word, it's, I know it can be kind of pejorative, but I'm going to say it, training students in how to make that move. To the abstract and back to the real world. Exactly. I think courses like history, courses like English, courses like sociology, whatever, religion classes, philosophy classes, those courses are mainly spent in that abstract space where you're arguing about ideas. You're arguing about the way one group perceived an idea or implemented an idea or, or how that idea affected the course of history. So even though learning about monks and the whatever 16th century blah, 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 doesn't seem like it's engineering work, it's training the mind, it's helping to educate the mind to deal with those kinds of abstract thoughts. And that ability to think abstractly then provides benefits for the engineer when they do this real world to abstract space to real world again. And, um, and I think, I think our, our students and engineers in general benefit from having that, that kind of education to work on both sides of the brain. Um, and without that, I think students, our students would miss something. So it's, it's, and, and I know I'm just talking from a practical point of view, like this is what our students need to be better engineers. But I think it also makes them, like Kate was saying, better people and better contributors to society, better members of church boards, better members of volunteer organizations, whatever, because you're always dealing with abstract ideas and the pull and the push that those ideas have on people and institutions. And unless you are conversant and and adept in that space, you can't be a strong leader. You can't be a strong engineer. So I think it's really important to have. Uh, and 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 we in the engineering department here, we we build our curriculum on that the core, as we call it, um, for, for particularly for those reasons. What? inspires you or gives you hope this this feels a little cheesy to ask i'm going to ask it anyway um when you think about the students that you work with here at calvin what gives you hope in a pretty complicated world right now about our future i'm really inspired by seeing what our students do after they graduate or even how they form their plans to go off and graduate you know 
when I was in college, I wasn't nearly as idealistic as a lot of our students are. And I don't mean I idealistic in a kind of dreamy way, I'm going to save the world. Um, but I think honestly, I was a bit more selfish ab about my own future plans than a lot of my students are. I did what was gratifying to me by staying in graduate school and getting a degree and becoming a teacher. Um, and I did know that was a career that was going to enable me to help people. But uh, I, I wasn't thinking as much because I wasn't at Calvin and I wasn't at a place that that had this larger vision of service and vocation. Um, and I wasn't thinking about how my work would help to build the kingdom, per se. Um, a lot of my classmates uh, went off to do things like become Wall Street bankers. And, uh, you know, the goal was to make a lot of money. Um, very few of my students seem to be motivated by a goal of making a lot of money. Uh, they go into all kinds of careers. They become teachers or social workers or librarians or engineers. Um, they're, they're all working for the kingdom in a variety of different ways, some very small scale, and teachers are certainly still working to build the kingdom. Um, but I see people doing much more ambitious things than I would have done, right? They, they go abroad and they, they create programs to assist refugees in, in, in Europe. They, um, they work in Christian schools in Indonesia and Cambodia. They found schools. Um, they, they serve in so many ways that I love watching as I keep in touch with them. And it's, it's a pleasure to keep, uh, keep in touch with former students who often become friends. And so that, that really continues to inspire me and, and kind of vindicates my, my choice to be a teacher here. Matt? I'd like to pick up on something that Kate said there near the end about serving. I, I think Calvin, at its best, inspires students to live lives of service in God's kingdom. And that can take many different forms. It can occur in many different places. Um, but it's, it's one of the great things that we do to invite students into that space, into that project. And like Kate says, it doesn't have to change every bit of the world, but, you know, the sort of the bloom where you're planted idea, you find yourself somewhere and how can I serve? What can I do here to make the world a better place? It's actually quite a, one of the joys of teaching for me is to know that we're in the process of inviting students into that, into that space and to um, encourage and enable and embolden them to, to do that as they leave our campus and as they go out and to, to serve in the rest of the world. It, it's, it's a, it's a point of, um, it's a point of great pride to know that some of our students pick up that vision and go do that. Thank you both for this conversation and for your great work at teaching. And thank you all for watching today. Thank you.